All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third in the series of virtual programming brought to you by the Georgia Recycling Coalition. I'm Gloria Hardegree, the Executive Director of GRC, and it's International Compost Awareness Week. So that's why we're holding this event today, uh, but more about that in a moment. First, I wanna thank Paige Beckwith with Keep Noonan Beautiful. Um, also, she's a GRC board member for assisting us this morning as the host of this webinar. A little bit of housekeeping, we ask that you remain muted um, so that because we are going to be recording um, this webinar to post it on our website when we are completed. Um, we'll ask you uh, to hold your questions until the end when all of our speakers have presented. We'll, we'll be raising hands and asking you to unmute in order to ask those questions and we'll address them again once our speakers have finished. So it's International Compost Awareness Week. It's being celebrated all over the country and parts of the world with events, observing organics recycling. Um, it is facilitated at the national level by the US Composting Council's Compost and Research Education Foundation. I've worked as a, um, a advisor on a, a national committee for International Compost Awareness Week for many years. So I know firsthand about what's going on and how we need to be celebrating and observing this. Georgia Recycling Coalition has included organics for years in our scope as sustainable materials managers, going beyond just bottles and cans and paper, but looking at all the other things in our waste stream that can be recycled or properly reused. We have worked with the Environmental Protection Division in Georgia to streamline the rules governing compost operation, whether at the community, garden, and urban farm level, or for large-scale compost manufacturers. We continue to work in growing the infrastructure for and the access to composting in Georgia. Um, one of the things we're doing to facilitate that now is we are in the initial stages of partnering with Georgia Swana chapter in developing a US Composting Council state chapter in Georgia, which will be probably under the umbrella of GRC initially, and hopefully it will work towards these goals that we have set for increasing compost access. It will we'll join 14 other state chapters currently. So if you're interested in that effort, please email us or message us via our website um, to include you in the stakeholders. So why do we care about composting? Well, you'll probably hear a little bit about that today, but just a few benefits to get us started. Composting and compost use replenishes soil for healthier plant and food growth, retains moisture, thereby conserving water, which is a huge important issue in our state, contributes to climate change abatement, and reduces valuable resources being sent to our landfill. And that's just a handful of a plethora of advantages of composting. So I'm gonna introduce to you our first speaker today and we're gonna go ahead and get into the programming. Brandon Lovett has been employed at Noonan Utilities for 25 years and presently serves as the Director of Water Operations. He was born and raised in Noonan. He's a son of Eddie and Teresa Lovett. His ideals and commitment to impact Noonan, Coweta County have been passed down to him through generations. His father, Eddie, served as principal of East Coweta High School, and his grandfather, the late Joe Norman, served as mayor of the city of Noonan. So he has a great legacy of service to this community. Brandon graduated from Noonan High School and completed his undergraduate, stud undergraduate studies at the University of Georgia. I have to always say, go dogs when I say University of Georgia. Um, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Health. So please welcome Brandon and possibly some of his staff members, which he'll introduce as we get into his program. Thank, thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate the invite today, certainly. And uh, Paige, there's no politics in my future ever. So don't, don't, uh, don't get ahead of yourself. So I do have a couple of our staff members here. I've got... Uh, on my left is Matt Kill. Matt's been with us for about 16 years. Uh, Matt serves as a manager in our organization within water operations, and his responsibilities are wastewater treatment as well as the composting division. And JR is on my right, JR Vicknair. He's been with us 19 years, and he is our compost supervisor. So 
excited to have these two guys with us. So we'll we'll um, we'll try to stay within our time constraints. We've got a few things to go over. I'd like to um, just as a quick agenda, I will go through kind of who we are as new utilities to give you an understanding of that. Uh, a little bit about our composting, how we got there. Uh, we'll show you a short video of our compost site. Matt and Jr. will go through our operations, and then we'll. Um, maybe in with some questions and answers as, uh, as y'all mentioned earlier. So with that, I'll get started. And I want to let you guys know that Noonan Utilities, we were chartered in 1904. We are a commission. Um, so that means that city council uh, appoints our uh, council, our commission, our, we're uh, governed by a three person board. So we are responsible for everything that is utilities, water, sewer, and power within the city of Noonan. Um, so to go way back, it was in the year 2005, 2006, we started, uh, we, we always land apply our biosolids. So our, our composting operation really functions around the biosolids uh, and the biosolids are really the byproduct of wastewater treatment. And so in 2004, 2005, as we were landfilling, we started to incur great cost for that landfilling. Um, we saw, I believe in 2004, we saw an increase of about 70%. At the time we were paying around $600,000 a year to, to uh, dispose of our biosolids. The following year, we saw an increase of about 30%. So we had no control whatsoever on where that was headed and where it was gonna take us. And for me personally, that was extremely concerning because uh, we, we were pretty much chasing a, you know, a budget number at that point and had no control of that. So we started to look into and to understand and study composting operations. So in 2005, we began the design of, that, of our facility. And in 2000, I believe fellow 2006 was really the first time we started making compost. So, yeah. A little bit about the design of the facility. We are fortunate to own about 2,500 acres in Coweta County. We purchased that many years ago for the purpose of land applying wastewater. And if, uh, if any of y'all have followed that discussion over the years, as we entered into the drought starting back in the mid 2000s, land application of wastewater more or less fell out of favor with the state. They wanted all that water back into our streams. And so we, we put the halt on that project, started to enhance some of our wastewater treatment operations. And since then we've stayed in the streams. Now we have continued to keep our land application permit viable because just as the state changed their mind on, on it years ago, we want to be in a good position if ever that falls back into favor. So we will continue to maintain and own, and own that property. And that afforded us the, the ability, quite honestly, to get into land, to get into composting, because just purely because of the land costs here in Coweta County. So already owning that property, that was not something that had to figure in necessarily to our decision, decision to go to um, landfilling. So our, our site is about a 30, a little over 30 acre, 30, 35 acre site that sits almost in the middle of, of about 2000 acres. As we designed this facility, one of our major hurdles was just the perception of composting by our neighbors. So if you look at our site from an overhead, you will notice that we sit about a mile from the road. So we made a, a conscious effort to move this facility away from, not, not for any reason that we believe would be harmful to our neighbors, or impactful at all to them, but just as an effort to be a good neighbor, we move the facility back a, a great distance from the road. So we are, fortunately, we are, I guess, somewhat sheltered to everything that's going on around us out there. And that's that's been a, a nice um, addition to our site. Um, as far as the permitting goes, that's probably the odd thing for our site. We are permitted through EPD, but it is part of our NPDES permit. So as you're probably aware for each of our, well, for all of our treatment facilities, we hold NPDES permits. And so this, um, 
this composting actually falls under that permit, which was a good thing during permitting. But as we talk maybe later in this presentation about a few challenges, it has proven to be uh, somewhat of a liability as we have looked to grow or to bring other facets into our into our facility and into our organization. Um, so I tell you all that to, to basically maybe solidify the thought of, of why we went to composting. And, and if you look at that, as I mentioned, the landfill budget, we were approaching and getting north of about a million dollars there. And that was for hauling and tipping fees for our biosolids from our plants. Our budget currently at our composting facility is about $750,000. So we have, you know, we've saved a substantial amount of money money we do have some product that we sell there so we our, our facilities in the past few years have become profitable um, point being that we, we are glad we made the decision from a financial standpoint but we've also done a few other things we believe we have certainly created jobs in our community uh, jr's got a staff of five out there right uh, not including matt um, so we've created those jobs there, and, and I believe we've done a great service to the environment in producing a product that uh, has become very, very popular in and around our community, a great soil amendment and something that we see people using every, everywhere from, from greenhouses to the hunter who is planting food plots, the guy who's growing corn and everything in between from rose gardens to you know, backyard vegetable gardens. So we've been, we've been fairly successful in that. So with that, let me, uh, let me attempt if I can to share my screen. We'll show you guys a short video and then we'll be back with kind of the operation and how that works. Edit. So obviously not a lot of dialogue there, but something that will give you guys a little bit of a background as JR and Matt start to uh, talk a little bit about the operation. So I'll turn it over to these guys. Everybody there, y'all can hear us okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right, here we go. So, so as you can see in, in the video, the, the compost yard in itself is comprised of, of two main ingredients right so the biosolids we dewater from our wastewater treatment facilities um, is one part and the green tree debris is the second major part so as we dewater our uh, biosolids from our wastewater facilities that's what we obviously were landfilling in um, years previous of 2006 on average um, we process 1.5 million tons of biosolids annually now at our composting facility, as well as 120,000 yards of green tree debris. So uh, on a daily basis, we do water from our wastewater treatment facilities. We truck that material to the compost yard. That biosolid is the organic load um, that will be processed into our class A soil amendment. To get us there, the catalyst for our carbon source is the, the green tree debris. Um, the, the facility is set up 
on a tipping fee basis. So as we accept green tree debris, um, no construction debris, only green vegetation um, is acceptable. We have a tipping fee associated with that. Um, it can come in in many forms, but the most common form is a 30 yard roll off container, mostly from lot clearing, development, home building. And, and as you know, around Noonan, um, that's been a busy trend uh, the last five or six years, especially. That is the main source of our carp. When we accept that green tree debris, we organize it, we sort it. Um, based on stumps, clean wood, treetops, that sort of thing. Then we subcontract a grinding service to come in and grind that material. So it is, is usable in our mi mixing operation. Um, when we first developed our SOP, the mixing ratio was two to one, two part wood chip, one part biosolids mixing ratio. We've increased that to three to one because we feel like it gives us a better end result a better product long-term. Um, so what we do is essentially incorporate enough carbon source with our biosolids to get the degradation and, and the temperature reaction that we're looking for. Um, JR, can you, can you explain more of the tent operation and what we're looking for um, on a daily basis to, to produce a class A biosolid? As the, as the spawn solid comes in, we mix with the green tree waste, as Matt was saying. We stack into a 120 yard bin, um, static air piled, force air into these piles to keep, to, to uh, promote the, the heat that we need. We get these piles to 131 degrees for three days continuous. Um, at that point, we have vector attraction reduction, which reduces the pathogens, kills anything else that's left in it. Um, once we get to that temperature, so those three days we pull these bins out and we wind roll them as you saw in the video. Um, we have a machine that turns these piles consistently. Once these piles are set on the yard for about 180 days, we begin our sampling. Um, once these piles have come back to be clean and free, then we begin our screening process and turn that soil amendment to any desirable usable product, whether it's mixed with sand or a new sod installation, whether it's to a topsoil blend for a 50-50 plant mix, um, or you can use the, the, the new soil as it's deemed the soil amendment for a straight top coat fertilizer supplement if needed. As JR mentioned, we, we, win, we windrow our material and we basically windrow it in quarters worth of volumes. In other words, first quarter of the year, we grid that material out. Second quarter of the year goes into the designated area. And as Darren mentioned, we send those composite samples off to a soil control lab. Um, it's based in California. That organization has been helpful for us from a marketing standpoint because they give us a wide variety of um, maturity levels um, and, and a lot of different parameters that help us market our material when it's in a finished form. The, the one thing that we do have at our advantage is the fact that once we pass for fecal and salmonella. Um, there are ranges there that are deemed safe and healthy. Once we have reached those levels of treatment and it's deemed a class A biosolid, we also have a long list of metals that are tested um, to, to continue to promote the, the confidence in our product. The, the wastewater treatment facilities also uh, through our effluent quality and our effluent toxicity testing and priority pollutants testing, we can, we can designate our biosolids to be metal free, which is a big concern for any grower uh, or any end use. Um, and also our pretreatment program from a, a sewer use ordinance standpoint, helps us uh, decide if and when a customer wants to tie onto our system, if it will in, in fact, impact our end result uh, in, in our compost product. Fortunately, we don't have any industrial influence on our system, so we are confident in our product once we get to that 180 day or 280 day uh, mark. Um, that's when we, we screen um, the material 
which you saw in the video. We screened the material. We're just, in fact, getting the wood debris out that we use as the carbon source. We're done with it. We're getting the wood debris out. And what's left over is a beautiful class A soil amendment with a lot of nutrient load. Um, that is what we consider our new soil product that we have sold historically as our compost new soil product. Um, as you saw in the video, that was a result of our tornado that hit our hometown a, a year ago. We have increasingly um, assumed more green tree debris than we've needed. Um, we take in 350 to 400 loads on average per month. We really only need about 175 loads per, per month. So what that has done for us is allowed us to go down some other avenues to find more products to sell. So what will happen is when we call our grinder um, to, to facilitate a, a grind, we will screen that wood debris, the fines, the topsoil that's in those grindings can be set aside. Um, and, and we basically split our product line into a biosolids product line. And then we have blends that are associated with this topsoil blend that has nothing to do with biosolids. So, for the customer that has any reservation of using a biosolids product, we have a full scale topsoil line that we have been able to reclaim out of these tree debris loads that are coming in, whether it's native topsoil that comes off a building lot or quite honestly, you know, wood chips that have sat and, and degraded over time. So we've been able to really extend our product line to help substantiate our profitability uh, over the years which has been a wonderful, uh, wonderful avenue for income. Um, as you saw in the video, we are blessed to have the ability to invest in a lot of capital equipment. It does take land, it does take space, it does take equipment, it does take people. But all, uh, all of that being said, we feel really good about our environmental sustainability and the fact that we're keeping 1.5 million tons of biosolids out of a landfill every year. And we're keeping 120,000 yards of, of green tree debris out of a landfill or quite honestly, out of another um, uh, place where, where these, these businesses would take it. We've experienced just a regional experience. There's no place to take this tree debris. So we have loads coming from 50, 60, 70 miles in some cases away um, because there's no place to take it. So we feel like we're also being a, a, a good steward of, of, of the debris, but also the local economy, because there's probably what, 75 businesses that are building a business around tree debris removal. And we're honestly, quite honestly, the only place that takes it responsibly. Um, and we are proud of the fact that we are probably one of the only facilities that does what we're doing uh, around. I, I don't know if there's a, another successful story out there that does what we do on the scale that we do it. So um, we've had some challenges with selling material over the years, but we've, 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 we've reached a point where we have our consistent wholesale accounts, our consistent landscape accounts, and our consistent homeowner um, um, interest to the point where, quite honestly, we're, we're making it and selling it as fast as we can make it. So. We're very excited about the, uh, the way we're able to be responsible for, for our environment locally um, and, and utilize these products in a, in a beneficial way. You good? Yes, sir. So um, you've got a good understanding now of how we do things and, and we'll close with uh, certainly some questions and, and some answers, hopefully, but uh, I want to mention a few of the challenges that we have out there. And certainly, as Matt just alluded to, one of the big challenges we have is the magnitude of the operation, right? As you watch the video, you see a lot of yellow equipment running around. So that big equipment is not only maintenance, maintenance intensive, but uh, it's, it's very expensive. So you, you know, this facility, from a capital standpoint, um, takes a strong backing in order to keep it running. Uh, a big factor for us and in, in being in the water, wastewater and power business, we are somewhat insulated from the economy, but this is the one division that we have is, that is very driven by the economy. Uh, you, you can see we're certainly producing the same amount of biosolids every year from our wastewater plants, 
but that green tree waste that's coming in can fluctuate as I, we can tell you exactly what the economy is doing based on the number of loads that JR is bringing into that facility. So it's, it's very interesting to watch how that ebbs and flows over certainly the, the, the past uh, 15, 16 years to match the economy. The biggest thing, and everybody's tired of hearing it, but the supply chain is certainly a big factor for us across our organization, but just getting material uh, is, is a big hassle for us now, getting equipment. Um, and then the last thing we'll mention, and I brought it up earlier, but it's the, it's the actual permit that we hold. So we have had an opportunity over many years to talk to a lot of different people that actually came to us seeking our help uh, for some disposal needs that they may have. And that ranged from local utilities that needed disposal of their biosolids and wanted to work with us on a composting operation to uh, many years ago, we talked to the Georgia farmers market that needed disposal of uh, vegetables, waste, that kind of thing. And these guys actually ran a trial a pilot with, with the Federal Reserve, and they were bringing us shredded money uh, to compost and see how that worked. Uh, all those things we can do, but we're pigeonholed by our permit. And... Um, at the state level, it appears that because there's not really a box to check for other material, then there's not a lot of discussion that's, that, that they're willing to have with us on, um, on that front. I don't know if there's any state folks on the call or not. I don't mean any disrespect by that, but that there is certain, we certainly have a challenge when we want to investigate or uh, look at opportunities to grow the facility from a, a permitting point of view. So with that, we'll close. I don't know if you guys want to, if there's any questions, we can certainly take those now or wait to the end, whatever the protocol is. Great. Thank you so much, Brandon and your team. That was amazing information. I am blown away by the metrics um, and happy to know that we have a great deal of diversion going on in your community for these materials that otherwise would end up somewhere where they would have no benefit at all. Um, so thank you all. Um, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to hold questions until we finish our second speaker. And we're going to really pivot here. Um, and we've looked at the technical and operational aspects of composting. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about the outreach aspect because we know there is um, some, there are some challenges in buy-in from the community. Hopefully those have, have wavered over the years and more people are coming around to the understanding that compost and composting is a good activity and not just something that um, they have to be concerned about. So with that, we're going to have um, Maggie Miller, uh, who is the waste reduction intern at athens Clark County Solid Waste Department Recycling Services. She focuses on composting, zero waste events, tours, education and promotion. And she's gonna share with you some of the activities surrounding International Compost Awareness Week um, from past years where they've been very uh, aggressive in getting the word out, outreach to their community, as well as possibly some things that they're doing currently this week. So Maggie, we're gonna turn it over to you um, to get started. Well, thank you for having me on. Let me share my presentation. So just give me one second. So let's present this guy. Hopefully I can get it to work. So I work underneath the government in athens Clark County as an intern. So as Gloria said, I help with all things zero waste and composting and recycling. So this is how we are celebrating Compost Awareness Week. So we have partnered this year with Keep athens Clark County Beautiful, the Athens Farmers Market, the State Botanical Gardens, our local library, um, another farmers market out in Winterville, and then UGA's Extension Office. So our year round efforts, we do have a commercial composting facility it opened up in 2011 and we have about 4.5 paved acres to use for composting. And that's this top picture. So we use 
aerated static piles to pump air into the piles made up of leaf and limb. And that's either mixed with biosolids that we get from the water reclamation facility or um, food scraps that we collect from businesses and organizations and through our drop-off program that we have in Athens. So we offer uh, compost collections to businesses and organizations with roll carts. So it's very similar to how recycling works. They just put their food scraps and organic materials onto the side and they pay a fee and we collect it weekly. And then we also have this compost drop off. So we have, it's free to the public. It is five drop off locations in the Athens area where residents can go any time of day and drop off their organics for composting. And then we also offer guided tours of our compost facility and we advertise our composting facility at our tabling events throughout the year to really get people to know about it because it is, a lot of people just don't, don't know about it. So advertising that. And then we also have zero waste events throughout the year where we offer reusable items such as plates, cups, utensils to be used at local events like birthday parties, office meetings, you name it. And this event kind of doubles as an educational experience for guests to understand how much waste can be saved reusing and composting. So we offer compostables as well, along with the reusable items. And we also offer portable waste bins for recycling and composting. So people can really see how much waste is diverted from the landfill. And every, like we get so many responses being like, wow, I only threw away like one trash, like one little trash bag that's smaller than like anything they've ever used before. So it's nice to see people's reaction and understanding that there is a way to be closer to zero waste. And then we also started a mandate along with our recycling mandate. Um, in the end of 2019, we added that compostable wares are required for events with two or more public vendors. So this, unfortunately, since that was the end of 2019, Due to COVID, we kind of had our first real event last weekend, really mandating this since public events kind of were axed during 2020. So last week at Twilight, we were really able to utilize this mandate and have all these public vendors use compostable wares so that everyone could throw both their utensils and their food in the same bin. So this year, how we're advertising our International Compost Awareness Week, we had a flagpole ad, which is a local weekly publication. And this was a full page spread that I made for the green issue of the flagpole, which was during the week of Earth Day in April. So this is a great way to gear up and have people read about the next coming weeks with International Compost Awareness Week. And so we advertised our compost sale and how to really compost in Athens because we're able to compost anything that was once alive and really educate them on landfill waste. And then we also included more advertisements in our water bill. So this was a double-sided flyer inserted into the county's water bill, which goes out to all residents with water service. So this was a great way for people who are not in the typical um, circles of zero waste and recycling to know what's going on in the community and how we are helping. So for week-long activities during this week, we had this social media move where it's called Get Caught Composting. And this is our Mayor Gertz. This is from a few years back, last year, the year before, I can't remember exactly, but this was his little Get Caught Composting hashtag. So we really tried to advertise that. And then we have a compost sale all week and it is half priced. So it's $10 per cubic yard. A cubic yard is about the size of the back of a pickup truck. So it's a great way to know like when you're hauling it in. And we also are offering a giveaway. So when you bring your compost in or your food scraps in a bin, you can get compost, finished compost in the bin that you brought it in. So a nice little swap. And then we advertise our food scrap drop-off program for residents. And this is a little picture of just how it works. There's just a rollout cart. People can go there 24 hours in the day, 24 seven and drop off their compost. So these are our activities that were specified this year. So we had, we kicked off the week with offering compost tours and we also shared GRC's compost recipes. So thank you for all the content we cre you create because it really helps us out. 
And then we made a story time at our library. And this is Rotten. This book is by Anita Sanchez. And it's about how rotting and decomposition is really necessary for new life. And also at the library, we are doing a edible compost, which is with um, UGA's extension office. So this is using gummy worms, dyed cornflakes that are green, and other like pretzels as sticks to really show kind of the middle age, middle school age children, how composting works with needing like the nitrogen and carbon based and then having a nice snack because it is this program is offered right after school and the middle school is right next to the library. So this is a great way for them to get a snack after school. And then we have at the State Botanical Gardens. These are year round programs, but this these two this week are geared towards composting. So the State Botanical Gardens have these two activities called Sweet Pea Garden and Garden Gnome. So it engages with kids and with garden and nature activities led by gardener staff and volunteers. So we really thank the State Botanical Gardens for having that with us. And then our director at ACC, she is doing a kind of master composting lecture online, but that's not until next week actually. So we're extending our compost awareness week, but this is informing everyone on how to compost, the materials for composting and the recommended structures and methods for you personally. And at the farmer's market this week, we are offering a compost bin sale and the proceeds go to Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful. And these compost bins, they're called Earth Machines, they're pretty big and they're um, $50 and they come with a kitchen compost container, which are these small ones. You can see the bottom picture. Those we sometimes give away because people really like having those. They help with keeping gnats out. They're a nice way to keep compost on the, on the counter and you can just quickly throw your food scraps in there. And I will hopefully play just a little second. Happens. You got your brown, your carbon source, your nitrogen source. You're adding water to the... So hopefully you could hear that. Could everyone hear that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Just making sure the sound was shared as well. So that was from past years, our, we recorded it and so we have it online as well. And in past years, these are some of the activities. So we had vermicomposting um, workshops and build a worm bin because vermicomposting is utilizing worms to break down organic material. And this is great for small spaces. Suki, our um, director, really kind of went into this last year with it and how it's really great for people who don't have a big space or don't have as much food scraps as we need. So it's great for at home and teaching that way. And that was at the State Botanical Gardens. And then we, UGA used to offer compost tours on the research campus. And then two of our compost collection customers, Maypole and Hendershots, they offered um, educational sessions where they taught the basics of composting from a master and seeing how th this restaurant can operate at net zero using compostable products. Maypole is really great about having their front of house restaurant compost as well, not just back of house. So they have um, displays of their waste and showing what can all be either reused, recycled, trash or composted. And usually the trash is pretty small because they're able to really educate with signs above each one showing what exactly can go in. So that's a great way to personalize and make it pretty easy for the public. So this is kind of my wrap up. I kind of went through that really quickly, but we offer a bunch of other things online. You can find them here at our websites. And we also wanted to show you, just I'll show you this quick little video on how we compost here. Food scraps and compostable wares are mixed in with the mulch at a three to one ratio, meaning three parts carbon or mulch and one part nitrogen or food scraps. That mixture is then placed on a series of perforated pipes in a system called aerated static piles. Each set of four pipes 
is connected to a blower or fan that forces air through the pipes and through the compost. So that was Mason describing our compost facility. And so this is actually this whole YouTube site. You can find it, a whole tour of our compost facility. So that's a great way for people who can't go out there physically, they're able to see how we compost. So thank you all for allowing me to share the op this opportunity to share about Athens and how we are trying to celebrate composting and really get composting out there. So if you're interested in any of our events, you can go to these, this website. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. That, it was a great presentation. Uh, we appreciate your enthusiasm and your expertise. And boy, does Athens Clark do some cool events. Um, I can't think of a better place that I would want to intern if I were you. So congratulations on that position as well. Okay, we are to the point where we can do Q&A. Paige, if you'll kind of assist me. If you have any questions, um, please raise your hand, unmute, and we will uh, call on you. So now's the time. Technical questions, outreach and education questions. Anyone? Okay, Jacqueline. Hi, good morning, everybody. I turned my screen off because I realized how ugly my background is. But anyway, I just wanted to ask both of the composters, do you do the post consumer like collect from restaurants as well um, for both of your facilities? Um, and has that been a struggle with contamination? So we do not, many utilities, we do not do anything in the food waste space. So we, we're not in that area. I can touch on this a bit. So we get a bunch of our compost from Atlanta from restaurants. And then we also here in Athens, we offer the roll carts for commercial. So organizations such as like Greek Life, so this big like sorting fraternity houses, Kappa Delta actually does the roll carts and then a bunch of restaurants. I can't remember the number, but we haven't had too much of an issue with contamination. We get a lot more from just the drop off site since there's no oversight there, but it is nothing too bad because we have, we use a power screener. So the big objects get sent out the back where the fine particles that are used for composting goes out the front. So that helps a lot with managing contamination but then with restaurants it's also hard to because it is a paid service they have to pay for it so it's hard to get people on board that way right any other any other questions Anne. good morning i um, am interested in finding out about programs like this around the country. I'm a square foot gardening instructor and I teach online. So a lot of my students are in different states. So I was wondering, is there a, a coalition, an organization or a, a reference to other facilities around the country that offer the composting, the drop-offs as well as making the final product available to customers? Gloria, that might be something that we should we could send her in an email, maybe if there's a site yeah. that you recommend or I would I would tell you first and foremost that um, I, I will be checking with the US Composting Council website. They have a lot of great resources. Um, and that is a national effort. Um, also, just speaking locally, we've worked a great deal with the Food Well Alliance on um, getting community garden and urban farm activities. If you're familiar with Truly Living Well Garden in Atlanta, that would be a good resource for you to learn about. They've recently received a pretty substantial grant to do some extra things on that particular urban farm in Metro Atlanta. Um, but as far as national exposure, the majority of it comes through USCC for the, the Compost Council. and. Um, the Compost Education and Research Foundation, who is the facilitator of International Compost Awareness Week, um, has tons of resources on their website as well. So other than that, um, we'll try to reach out separately and see if we can get you any other resources. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that information. All right, 
We're closing in on just a few minutes left. Any questions? I will, uh, Anne's got one. Yeah, I do have one more question. You mentioned that uh, a lot of restaurants, I believe um, Ms. Miller was talking about restaurants have the, uh, the pickup bins. Do any schools or government agencies participate in this as well? So we have a Montessori school. I know for sure that compost and we have a bunch of like lawyers and accountants, like their firms that compost. I'm trying to think, I think through Athens, there are a couple organizations or government agencies that do compost, but I'm not positive. Is there anything that would prevent a school or do schools have a hard time getting to participate in programs like this? Is there some sort of obstacle that they just don't do it or that prevents them to, or this is just, uh, just hasn't been enough interest? I, I don't think it's a lack of interest. I think for, first of all, there is a cost involved and sometimes schools have challenges with funding these um, extracurricular programs. Um, so that sometimes is a factor with the schools um, the other thing would be access to infrastructure. And that's one of the reasons why we are working to continue to develop the infrastructure in the state by making the rules amenable to scaling up for facilities as well as attracting new business to the state. Um, and why we're looking to form a, a, a chapter of the US Composting Council here in Georgia um, so that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, a core group of stakeholders who are specific to this industry. So I think the big challenge right now is that infrastructure piece because there's just not access to it everywhere. Um, certainly not as predominant as it is in Noonan and in Athens and in Dublin, Lawrence County where there's another fully, um, fully um, accredited site, um, as well as in Gainesville, where there's another site. And of course, we have a compost manufacturer, Earth Products, here in Georgia, that's doing a similar process to what Noonan's doing with biosolids and a carbon source uh, specific to the ag industry here in Georgia. So uh, the challenge right now is growing the infrastructure. And then once that's in place, we'll be able to do more outreach to institutional organizations. I mean, there are already larger institutions like State Farm Marina and um, Mercedes-Benz Stadium and colleges and universities that are certainly embarking on this. It's just that we've got to spread the access of infrastructure for processing these materials before we can go seek out more um, opportunities for institutions to participate. Does that help answer that question? Yes, yes, it does. It helps me understand much better. Thanks. And I think the interest is, is definitely there. Um, we've just got to get it matched up with the access. Well, and to answer Jacqueline's question as well about contamination, I mean, certainly contamination does affect the biosolid um, composting facilities as well, because a lot of times tree waste, we have to try and educate our residents to not throw their shoes or garbage in with their bulk tree waste that might go from the city. We um, sometimes get some loads that our crew won't take to new utilities um, for composting because it's been contaminated with garbage. So things that you would think would be common, you know, or easy, kind of like your food waste and people that contaminate that, it comes in on both sides, you know, on both sides of the fence, whether it's biosolids or and tree waste or even um, food waste, like people just providing that education to residents and communities and giving them that information on how to recycle properly and what really needs to go into their containers is important, no matter what, what type of, whether it's composting or any other type of recycling. I think that's, that's an important fact to note. Um, I know Jacqueline had that question, but she yeah. probably knows that answer too, though. Overall, yes, we, we have a contamination issue across the board in the recycling and composting industry, no question. And it's just continuing to push that message out there about these are sustainable materials that can be brought into a process where they become useful products. Again, they are not garbage, they are not waste. Um, they're things that we need to separate. I mean, I would, I would love for composting for no other reason that 
to expand in Georgia, then we would hopefully keep more food waste out of the recycling stream because that certainly is a problem. Um, and the compostable serviceware that unfortunately is more environmentally sustainable, but is being thrown away now because of lack of access. And some people put it in their recycling bin, think, oh, well, it's compostable, I'll put it in my recycling bin. That's a big issue. So um, that's why we do these webinars and we hope that you have enjoyed the content today. I know I even learned a lot um, about what's going on. I wanna thank our speakers, Brendan and Maggie again. Um, I wanna thank you all for participating. Um, our next webinar is going to be in June and we're going to address diversity, equity and inclusion in our industry. Uh, we've learned that it's work that needs to be done in the recycling composting industry. So we're gonna address that um, and in the sustainability uh, realm as well. Um, so thank you Paige and Noonan for hosting us today. And with that, we'll close out and wish you a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. Thanks everyone.